Hey guys, today I'll be taking an updated look at the latest polls that have been released for the 2022 governor elections, and today we'll be filling in this map based on those new numbers. And so right now, polls are really interesting to look at because even many of the most Republican pollsters have Democrats leading in many of these gubernatorial elections. But no matter what happens, many of these races are going to be very, very close, especially some of these races in the Midwest and then in the Sun Belt as well. So I'm going to start off with with the states in the northern half of the country here, starting off with Pennsylvania, moving across Rust Belt to Maine, and then a look at the states here in the bottom left half of our map, starting off with Oregon, and then moving down to Florida. And so Democrats right now have a one-point lead nationwide in terms of the generic ballot, not as well as they were doing in 2020 or 2018, but this is significant, and we are seeing a boost right now for Democrats in many of these races. So in this video, I'll be taking a look at the latest polls that have been released for the 2022 governor elections and what they mean for those races. And so the states I've already filled in are basically going to go to either party. If it's blue, it's going to go to the Democrats. If it's red, it's going to go to the Republicans. The margins may not be exactly solid in the very end. I don't think Ned Lamont is going to win by over 15% in Connecticut, or maybe we might see closer races in Iowa, Ohio, or Alaska. But honestly, these are not competitive races. The parties that I've given them to are going to win those races. So we have the 13 competitive races on our map for this year's governor elections, and so I'm going to start off with the state of Florida. This is the governorship currently held by Tom Wolf. Wolf was reelected in 2018 to a second term by 17% against Scott Wagner, and so now he's not going to be able to run for a third term as he is term limited. And so Josh Shapiro is the new Democratic nominee, and he'll be running against Doug Mastriano. Mastriano is probably the worst GOP governor nominee in the entire country. He is just way too right wing, and he is not going to win this race. I mean, Democrats do have a slight edge in Pennsylvania if it's a 2022 year where we have a Democratic president in office. Yes, Republicans do have a chance in the Pennsylvania governor election, but with Doug Mastriano as the candidate, they simply do not stand a chance. The state of Pennsylvania is going to stay blue on our map, and right now polls suggest a likely margin of victory for Josh Shapiro. I mean, just look at the 530 forecast right now. It really just favors Democrats so much. If you look at the forecast in the state of Pennsylvania, if you let me pull it up here, as of right now, Josh Shapiro has, I believe, an 85% chance at defeating Doug Mastriano. I mean, really, this race is so solid for the Democratic Party. If you go back just a couple of months ago, he only had a 75% chance at winning. So definitely, we're seeing a huge shift in Pennsylvania, and it is not shifting in favor of the Republicans in any way. Next up, we have the election in Michigan. Gretchen Whitmer was just elected by 10-point margin in 2018, and so now she is running for her second term in office. Whitmer currently leads by 11.3% against Tudor Dixon. Dixon is not well known of a candidate at all. She only won the Republican nomination after James Craig was disqualified. So Tudor Dixon had a very late start to this campaign, and she is not somebody that really has a chance at winning in Michigan this time around. Yes, Michigan governor elections can be very competitive, what with Gretchen Whitmer has a strong incumbent, she is going to win her second term. Even the most recent Trafalgar poll has Whitmer up by 4%, and the 530 forecast currently has Michigan as a likely Democratic state. She has a 92% chance at winning. Even though Doug Mastriano is the Republican nominee in Pennsylvania, Gretchen Whitmer has a higher chance at winning in Michigan, and Tudor Dixon is not that great of a candidate either. She is on the far right, but not as extreme as Mastriano. So even though Republicans have a slightly better candidate in Michigan, they don't stand a chance in the Wolverine state either. So Michigan right now, according to the polls, is going to be a likely Democratic state. However, in Wisconsin, we do have a much more competitive election. Tony Evers, who won his first election in 2018 by 1% against Scott Walker, is now running for a second term. In 2018, it was a pretty impressive victory for the Democrat, as Scott Walker was at the time the incumbent governor running for a third term in office. There are no term limits in Wisconsin, and so if Tony Evers were to win in November, he would be the first Democratic gov gubernatorial candidate to win a governor election in Wisconsin as a Democrat with a Democratic president 
president in the White House since 1962. And there have been very many Democratic governors in Wisconsin since then. It's just they typically are almost always elected when there is a Republican president in office. So the party of the presidency really does have an effect on Wisconsin voters. And so right now, Tony Evers is in a very difficult election against Tim Michaels. Out of all three of the candidates we've seen so far on the Republican side, Tim Michaels is by far the most moderate. Yes, he did receive the endorsement of Donald Trump, but he is not nearly as pro-Trump as Tudor Dixon or Doug Mastriano. And so if you do look at the polls between Tony Evers and Tim Michaels, you'll see that Evers has led in all the polls that's been released since the primary. One poll did show the race as being even, and even the most recent Trafalgar poll has Tony Evers leading by 1%. I think that right now Tony Evers is in a pretty good position, but he can definitely still lose this race. Wisconsin is going to be very, very competitive, and a one-point margin in the polls is nothing for Evers. Democrats almost always underperform expectations in Wisconsin. A 5-3, though, does believe that Tony Evers is going to win. They have it as a lean Democratic state, giving Tony Evers a 66% chance at winning. In my personal opinion, I think Wisconsin is going to be a tilt Democratic state. I think that if Tony Evers is going to win, it's going to be by a very small margin. Tim Michaels is not that poor of a candidate, but according to the polls right now, Wisconsin is going to just barely lean for the Democratic Party. And moving on to the final state in the upper Midwest, we have Minnesota, the election between Tim Walls and Scott Jensen. Tim Walls was also elected in 2018 by a margin of 11.4% against Jeff Johnson. Democrats did very well in the Midwest four years ago. They almost won in both Ohio and Iowa. Kim Reynolds and Mike DeWine barely won their first terms in office. Of course, Illinois and Pennsylvania were both solid, and Michigan was almost a double-digit margin. Minnesota was double digits as well, and of course, in Wisconsin, Tony Evers flipped this state against a pretty unpopular but still incoming governor. So in 2018, Democrats did pretty well in the Rust Belt after losing it in 2016 to Donald Trump. Out of all of these states, Democrats only won Illinois and Minnesota in the previous presidential election at that point, and so Democrats are probably still going to do okay in the Rust Belt this time around, but considering that it is going to be a year that favors Republicans much more than 2018, I don't I don't think Democrats are going to do nearly as well. Ohio and Iowa, with these two incumbent governors running for re-election, they're pretty much guaranteed to win a second term. And of course, even though the races in Michigan and Pennsylvania are going to be that competitive, simply because of the nominees that the GOP has put up, Wisconsin and Minnesota are still going to see some pretty competitive races. Right now, Tim Wells only leads on average by 3% in the polls. How the good news for him is that a Scott Jensen internal poll has still has Walls leading by 4%. Tim Walls is a pretty popular governor overall, and definitely is somebody that has a very good shot at winning this November. 530 believes that Tim Walls has a 91% chance of winning. I think this is just simply too high. Tim Walls is probably not going to win by a likely margin. I think around 3 to 4% is much more likely for the Democratic incumbent there. But according to the polls right now, Minnesota is going to be a lean state for the Democratic Party. And so right now, Democrats are looking pretty good in the upper Midwest, with polls suggesting wins in all four of these gubernatorial elections. And now we're going to move on to the only competitive election in New England, and that, of course, is the race in Maine. Janet Mills, who was elected in 2018 by 8%, is running for her second term in office against former Governor Paul LePage, who was elected in 2010 and 2014, both very good years for Republicans, and so LePage was ineligible to run for a third consecutive term in 2018, but the state of Maine does allow its governors to run for a third non-consecutive term, and that's exactly what Paul LePage is doing this year, trying to get back his old Old job. Janet Mills, though, is a popular governor and is leading by 4.5% in the polls on average. However, there's only, only been two recent polls, and these polls are from a four months ago, so we don't have any new data from the state of Maine. But 538, though, seems to be pretty confident in Janet Mills right now. They currently give her a 83% chance at winning her re-election. I do think 538, though, is overestimating Democrats in many of these races, especially in the Rust Belt. Josh Shapiro, his chances of winning, I think, are lower than 85. And Gretchen Wimmer, especially, she does not have a 92% chance at winning her re-election in Wisconsin. I think it should be much, much closer. So even though I don't fully agree with 538, Jenny Mills right now is still in a good position in the state of Maine, and according to the polls, she's going to win by a lean margin this November. And so now we're going to move on to all of our Sun Belt races. I'm going to include Oregon as part of the Sun Belt, just kinda. It's right above California and Nevada, but in the state of Oregon, we have a three-way race between 
Tina Kotek, Christine Drazen, and Betsy Johnson. Johnson is not a libertarian. She's actually a former Democrat running as an independent in this election. Tina Kotek, quite frankly, is not that great of a nominee for the Democratic Party. And Kate Brown, the incumbent Democratic governor, is not a popular or good governor either. That's why Democrats are doing so poorly in this race. In 2018, Kate Brown only won in Oregon by 6.4%, the same year the Democrats won by 17% in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And this is the state of Oregon in 2018, one of the best midterm years for Democrats. They won 23 governorships, up from the 16 that they won in 2014, the midterm prior. So in Oregon right now, Kate Brown is having a major effect on this race. People do not want to vote for the Democratic establishment. That's what Kate Brown was, and that's what Keenan Kotek is right now. And so Christine Drazen actually led in the most recent Republican internal poll, but not on average, Keenan Kotek does maintain a 4.5% lead against Drazen. Betsy Johnson does also have a very significant amount of support, especially for an independent candidate, but independents almost always do worse than expected, and so right now I do still expect Tina Kotick to win her first term in office, but it will be a very difficult election. But right now, Oregon is going to be lean based on the latest polls and also my very own projection. And of course, Oregon right now, quoting 538, is also a lean Democratic state. They actually give Betsy Johnson less than a 1% chance of winning, and 530 believes that Betsy Johnson is only going to win 11% of the vote in the very end. In the state of Nevada, Steve Sislak currently leads over Joe Lombardo by a margin of 2.3%. Most of the recent polls have been looking good overall for Sislak, but the most recent Trafalgar poll does have Lombardo up by 3 percentage points. I think that this should not be too much to worry about for the Democratic incumbent. If you look at the 2018 governor election, the final Trafalgar poll did have Adam Luxalt up by 2%, and of course, in the very end, Steve Sislak still won by 4% statewide. However, 2022 is the year in which Democrats are less likely to outperform expectations. A two-point margin is still good for Sisolak, but he is still very, very vulnerable, one of the most vulnerable Democratic incumbents running for their re-elections this November. 530 seems to be pretty confident in Sisolak, though, giving him a 64% chance at winning. So according to both the polls and the 538 forecast, Nevada right now is a lean Democratic state, but definitely it is going to be one of the most competitive elections that we have this November. And we also have another very competitive election in the state of Arizona. Doug Ducey cannot run for a third term, so a new governor will be elected in Arizona. Ducey won by 14% in 2018, and so with him no longer on the ballot, it will be much more difficult for Republicans to hold on to the governorship this time around with Kerry Lake as the GOP nominee. Katie Hobbs currently leads by 1.9%, and the most recent Trafalgar poll only has Lake leading by 1% against Hobbs. Katie Hobbs has led in most of the polls that have been released for this election, and of course the Trafalgar poll having a Republican up by 1% really does not mean anything at all. Katie Hobbs is still overall in a better position to win this election, but Arizona is going to be very, very close. Arizona still has a very long history of voting for Republicans, and of course it only flipped in 2020. 2022 is still a bit too early to expect Democrats to do better than expected, and so the polls in Arizona have been known for overestimating Democrats and Democrats almost always underperform expectations, but I think in this governor election, Kerry Lake is a pretty poor nominee, and so if Kitty Hobbs can campaign well enough, she does stand a chance. If you look at the 530 forecast, currently Hobbs has a 53% chance at winning this race, so Arizona is going to be one of the most competitive elections this year. I think Arizona and Wisconsin are going to see the most two closest races, and so right now Arizona is going to be a lean state on our map according to the polls. And moving on to the state of New Mexico, in this state we have probably one of the worst Democratic incumbent governors this year. Michelle Lujan Grisham is running for a second term. She won by 14% in 2018, but she now has a sexual misconduct scandal against her. She is also not popular in her state, and so winning re-election for Grisham is going to be difficult. Mark Ronchetti is also a pretty strong Republican nominee. I think the GOP made a good decision here. Ronchetti came very close to defeating Ben Ray Lujan in the 2020 election, was closer than expected in a year like 2020. So Michelle Lujan Grisham has done pretty well in the most recent polls. The most recent 
recent research in polling poll, this is an A-rated pollster, has Luhan Grisham up by 7%. So I do believe right now that Michelle Luhan Grisham is going to win her re-election by a lean margin. I don't think she's going to win by 7%, but a 4% average I think is pretty accurate for the race right now. So Michelle Luhan Grisham currently is projected to win by a lean margin in New Mexico. 538 though gives her an 83% chance at winning a second term in office. And now moving on to the race that I like talking about the most personally, we have the gubernatorial election in Kansas between Laura Kelly, the incumbent Democrat, elected in 2018 by 5% against Chris Kobach and Derek Schmidt, the current Attorney General of Kansas. So Derek Schmidt has been leading in the two polls released. Now, most of these polls have been pretty old. I've removed the other polls that were conducted months ago, so I do have only the April and August poll, and right now, on average, Schmidt maintains a 3.5% lead. But both of these polls have been funded by Republicans. Republican sponsors. So Laura Kelly is probably going to do better than what these polls currently suggest. And if you have a GOP internal showing a Republican up by 3%, the race is going to be very, very competitive. Laura Kelly is the incoming Democrat, and so she definitely does stand a chance in this race. 530 actually believes that Laura Kelly has a better chance of winning this election than Derek Schmidt, even though it's Kansas. She currently has a 55% chance at winning. And so the reason why she won in 2018 was just because Chris Kobach was too right-wing of a candidate. I mean, if Republicans run these extreme nominees, they are going to lose. We've seen it time and time again. If they run unpopular candidates, the Republican Party is not going to win, even in the most conservative of states. I mean, you just saw in Alaska, Sarah Palin lost the House election there to Mary Peltola, a Democrat. So if Republicans continue to run candidates like they're doing in Pennsylvania or Michigan, they're not going to win elections in the future. So right now, according to the polls, Kansas is going to be likely Republican. But Laura Kelly, you definitely kind of count her out. She's the incumbent, and she is a pretty popular governor, considering considering how red Kansas is overall. And also just want to add that Kansas voted 60-40 to reject a ballot measure earlier this year to overturn abortion rights to the people of Kansas from the Constitution. And so as a woman and also a pro-choice candidate, Laura Kelly is going to gain a significant boost from that. Even though Kansas is one of the reddest states in the country, overall they do seem to be more pro-choice and pro-life by a 60-40 margin. And so of course Laura Kelly is going to be boosted by that fact, and in an election as close as the one we have in the state, it really Really could make a major difference. And so now moving on to the election that we have in Kansas, Better O'Rourke is running for the governorship against Greg Abbott. Abbott is running for his third term in office and currently leads in the polls by 8.9%. Greg Abbott has led in basically every single poll for this race. He is going to win his re-election, there's no doubt about that. Better O'Rourke may be a good nominee on the Democratic side. Abbott is not going to win by the almost solid margin that he won by in 2018, but he is almost guaranteed to win a third term at this point. 5-3 gives him a 96% chance at defeating Better O'Rourke. O'Rourke almost won the Senate seat in 2018. We're not going to see anything similar in 2022. So right now, Kansas is going to be a likely Democratic state or likely Republican state. Sorry, I meant to say Republican, but in the state of Georgia, we also have a very competitive election between Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams, although not as competitive as the race in 2018. Brian Kemp only won his first term by 1.4% four years ago, and Stacey Abrams is a good nominee on the Democratic side, but in 2022, as the incumbent, Brian Kemp is probably going to win his re-election to a second term. However, if you look at the Senate election in Georgia, we do see a much different story. Raphael Warnock leads by 1.7%, but Warnock is is actually the incumbent. So there's a huge discrepancy between the governor and Senate elections in Georgia. We're going to see a lot of split ticketing. And so right now, Brian Kemp should win his re-election to a second term. He is in a relatively strong position. Even though Brian Kemp and David Perdue tried to primary him, he won over 70% of the vote in that primary, despite the former president being against them. So Brian Kemp is overall a popular governor, even within the Republican Party, even though he did not help Donald Trump overturn the election results in 2020 in the state, and so right now 538 gives Brian Kemp an 84% chance at winning a second term in office. And finally, in the Sunshine State of Florida, this is the election with Ron DeSantis. DeSantis barely won his first term in 2018 by 0.39%. If Andrew Gillum was elected, I mean, the political landscape would be very different today. Ron DeSantis is now the frontrunner for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. And so in the polls right now, 
He is leading by 7% against Charlie Crist, the former governor and Democratic nominee, former Republican governor. And so if Ron DeSantis wants to become president anytime soon, he is going to have to win this race. And right now, things are looking good for him. Ron DeSantis has led in basically every single recent poll. He is not going to lose his re-election as long as things continue to go this way. If Ron DeSantis leads by 7%, we could definitely see a double-digit margin in this race. So right now, Florida is going to be likely for the Republican Party. Democrats simply do not stand to much of a chance here. Florida is continuing to shift to the right, and even though Charlie Crist is a former governor, I mean, he's lost many races in the last decade or so in the state of Florida on the national level. He lost the Senate race in 2010, and he lost the governor election against Rick Scott in 2014. So Charlie Crist is not the best nominee. I think that Nikki Freed would have even done better. And so right now, Charlie Crist is a member of the House, but he will no longer be in Congress or hold public office after this November. So Florida is definitely going to be a likely Republican state.